Hello, everybody. I think we'll get started now. Before we begin, I want to just uh, do a land acknowledgement. London, Ontario is situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Lunai Piwak, and the Atawandaran peoples, who have long-standing relationships to the land and this region of southwestern Ontario. This city is home to many First Peoples, specifically the Chippewa of the Thames, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie, Delaware Nation. In the region, there are 11 First Nations communities and a growing Indigenous urban population. The provisions regarding the settlement of non-Indigenous peoples here are governed by a long, stand, a long history of treaty making, and I'll just cite the 1796 London Township Treaty in particular. Now, my name is Theresa Hubble, and I'm a professor in the Department of English and Cultural Studies at Huron University College. And it's my pleasant duty to introduce Lee Miracle and then Candace Burnett. A member of the Stalo First Nation, Lee Miracle is an award-winning writer with an impressive list of publications, inclu including both fiction and nonfiction, as well as poetry, poetry and spoken word performances. And I just want to list a few because you can see how impressive this is. Sojourner's Truth and Other Stories, Sun Dogs, The Classic Raven Song, Daughter, Daughters Are Forever, Will's Garden, First Wives Club, Coast Salish Style, Celia's Song. That's all her fiction. Nonfiction, Bobby Lee, Indian Rebel, I Am Woman, A Native Perspective on Sociology and Feminism, Oratory, Coming to Theory, My Conversations with Canadians, and Memory Serves and Other Oratories. Poetry, Bent Box. Collaborations, my home as I remember, we get our living like milk from the land, telling it, women and language across cultures, reconciliation. And then there is an enormous list of uh, short stories and, and pieces collected in different journals and in different books. So uh, her most recent book I just read yesterday, and I, I kind of dreamt about it all night, My Conversation with Canadians. So you can see she's one of Canada's most prolific authors. Indigenous writing has a long history in this country, but there were decades in the 20th century when so very few Indigenous authored texts were published. There's never been any shortage of textual descriptions and characterizations of Indigenous people from the very first moments of the colonization of this land by Europeans. But these overwhelmingly came from settler writings and generally promoted settler concerns, views, and stereotypes most of which did damage to Native people and their communities. After the Native appropriation of debate, uh, sorry, Native appropriation of voice debate in the late 1980s and 1990s, which had a profound impact on the Canadian publishing industry, more and more Indigenous writing began to be published. Because she was one of the very few already published writers from a First Nations community, Lee Miracle's voice represented an influential intervention in this debate. It's no exaggeration to say that she personally has helped to pave the way for the blossoming of Indigenous writing that we are beginning to see now. An interviewer at Chatelaine magazine recently asked her the following question about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. You write about how reconciliation is a misnomer, that Indigenous people are still dying. What should we be talking about instead? And her response, the first part, truth, no truth, no reconciliation. I don't think there's a voice in Canada that speaks as much truth as Lee Miracles. Sometimes that truth hurts, but it needs to be said and we must take heed. While reading my conversations with Canadians yesterday, I was impressed with the courage and the incredible confidence it took to write such a book. Now let me just introduce Candace. Candace Burnett is a Cree woman from Fort Albany. She's an, she's an instructor at, at Huron and at Western. She's currently the interim um, specialty advisor to the provost at Western, and she is completing a PhD in the education department, and she's also a writer. So on behalf of Huron University College and all of us here, I want to welcome you to London Lee and to the Words Festival. We are fortunate to have this opportunity to hear you converse with Candace, and I would ask you all to please join me in a rousing round of applause for both of them. Wow, can, can everyone hear me? <laughs> it is such an honor to sit here with you and share space. 
Um, as you know, Lee, this is not the first time we've shared space before. <laughs> you have been one of my you have been one of my teachers. I have been one of your students at U of T. You have been one of my mentors over the years. And from time to time, I still call upon you with my emails, <laughs> trying to reconcile and make sense of the work that I'm doing in, in education. I don't know if I ever told you that the first time I read your work was well before I met you, about 15 years ago. I first came across your work in 1996, when I began my degree at the University of Toronto. I was up in the Robarts Library stacks, and I'll never forget the first three words of the book, I Am Woman. It changed my life. It read, scribble, scribble, scribble. <laughs> and, and I don't know what it was about those first three words, but I was immediately hooked into her storytelling. I think it was the act of trying to find space in the most unexpected places. That I was, and I was so impressed by the way that you weaved poetry and history and theory and prose together. It's something that I'm still trying to figure out how to do myself. Beyond Lee's impressive and long list of accomplishments as listed in the bio by Teresa, I know, Lee is, I, I know Lee on a more personal and intimate level. She's been part of my, my learning journey. As I mentioned, um, she's my teacher. She continues to be my teacher. And in just preparing for this talk, I realized how much I miss you. <laughs> and how awesome it is that I can just pick up a book and feel like you're there with me. I really enjoyed reading um, the book Conversation, my conversations with Canadians. It made me laugh out loud so many times. I could hear and feel your humor with me and your endless, and I mean endless. I took a course with Lee, Oral Traditions, and she is like an encyclopedia of historical information. It's amazing how much she knows. And I was, again, awestruck by that. And I can't deny your raw ability to just tell heartbreaking truths. And it inspires me every time. I want to talk to you a little bit about that book and what compelled you to write that book. <laughs> what compelled me? How do I turn this off? I'm not very good with technology. <laughs> At home, I would be. It was a time when. <laughs> <laughs> but here, you have to, you know, sound reasonable. <laughs> Um, I was sitting with a publisher from Book Hug, Book Hug uh, Jay Millar, and he cornered me and asked me if I wanted to have lunch. I'm always eager to have lunch, so I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so he was young and good looking too, that helps. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and he says, what are you thinking of writing in the future? And this idea popped into my head. <laughs> it's like, boom, and I, I swear it came from him. <laughs> I said. I'd really like to do something like my conversations with Canadians, which, you know, didn't sound like an exciting title when I was always thinking about it. Um, but he jumped on it right away. And he says, well, what, how do you think that's going to look? And I said, well, there's these questions Canadians asked me over the years. Some of them sounded really dumb and racist in the beginning, but I, I rethought them. And I want to write them so that I'm bringing Canadians with me to the center of wherever the hell it is we're all going together. I'm not sure where we're all going together, but I'm pretty sure that we're all going there. And in order to get there, we have to all be standing from the same starting point. So I wanted to bring you to my starting point, if that makes any sense. And he said, that sounds good. Um, what are some of the questions? And I said, well, the first one is from this big old white guy who was probably 60 and I was 26, I was a kid. And he says to me, so what are you going to do with all us white guys? Drive us into the sea? Mm. <laughs> mm, he thinks I can. <laughs> but then I said, ah, thank you that I, that I think you think I can. Uh, but I don't actually want to. <laughs> and then. I thought later with my European friend that I went there with, 
I said, um, he thinks I can drive them into the sea. She says, yeah, and I said, well, I can't. And, and uh, she says, but you probably know someone from your village who can. <laughs> I will look that person up. <laughs> so I go back into history and I realize one of my familial members, uh, uh, George, George Brothers, were the last people hung um, in British Columbia, four of them. And they were hung because their mother sang a song to the RCMP barracks and killed them all. And then I remembered, oh yeah, we could do that. Not me, but other people <laughs> could do that. We could sing you up or sing you down. So Celia's song is the dance of death where we sing you to death. Yeah, that happened in history a couple times. And it happened with these RCMP. And apparently these RCMP had raped a bunch of small girls. So that's why she went and sang them all to death. Well, the four boys hung for it because, you know, at the time, the patriarchs couldn't believe that a woman sang a song and these guys died. So they hung the, her four sons. And I thought, it was all in the newspapers. This guy would have been 20. He knew about it. He had a lot of reasons to be afraid of me. <laughs> Don't sing a song, okay? <laughs> While you're sitting there. <laughs> and then I thought, well, I wonder if all the other things that people have asked me that I thought was just plain racist really are. And that's when I discovered that stereotypes are born of the original moment. Yeah, the original moment it was true. But after that, people just paint you with a brush. So that's what made the book be born. <laughs> what do you hope people will take away from the book? Another way of looking at things. You know, I, 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 teach, I used to teach writing, creative writing in University of Toronto, and I'd say, you need another point of view. What do you mean? I said, lay down on the floor. So they'd lay down on the floor, they'd think I was so weird. <laughs> I'd say, what do you see? Well, the ceiling. <laughs> that's a different point of view, isn't it? I'm looking at the back of the room there and I see the sound room. And these people looking here will say, well, I see something else. So turn around, <laughs> look around, you know, like make full circle journey. So that's what I'm hoping because that's what I've done. I've turned around to try and see it from your side of the bridge, you know, and see, okay, I get it. In, in the book, conversations with Canadians, you talk about Indigenous orality <clears throat> and you talk about Indigenous memory as being something distinct, distinct from Western literary traditions and systems which are grounded in what I love, how you articulate materiality, which is the written word and the notion of Western property. Can, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Because I thought that was very a salient, important piece that you were talking about in the book. I don't think I gave it uh, as much attention as it probably deserves, but in sailor's tradition, we, we, we name something and then expect everybody to think about it. So I was, the things I name in that whole thing is things I hope you all think about. But one of the people that I met in Washington when I was the distinguished professor of Canadian culture there, can you imagine that? But anyway, <laughs> um, she wrote a book called We Are Born to Learn. And uh, the way she wrote it, I realized, oh my God, that's me. She's writing about me. So I went and visited her and I showed her what I called my wheel of understanding. And what it was saying was that if you say one and one is two, then you've compartmentalized the creative power of ma uh, mathematical fiction. Math is fiction. There is no zero, people. And you can't subtract anything. Even if you die, you can't subtract yourself. There's no sound that you make that's ever gonna leave. It just keeps going around and around and around. So hearing voices isn't necessarily insanity. You're just hearing on a different level than someone else. So that was the first thing that I noticed about 
arithmetic and that I don't deal with things that way. And I said to myself, well, at some point they'll give me the real deal and then I'll learn this stuff. <laughs> I thought nothing about arithmetic till ninth grade when this teacher says, well, you've all learned to add, subtract, multiply, and divide, and it's all fiction. Thank you, now I'm ready to learn. <laughs> and I discovered the, uh, the beautiful fiction of math is this. You can't do this without math. You can't do this without fiction. And then I started to think everything is fiction, even philosophy is a piece of fiction. Somebody has the philosophy that you need to compartmentalize and break things up and break them down. And someone says, no, you need to see the whole spiral down to a moment of peace through recognition and then spiral out to meet the world and see how it works. The second one is my philosophy. The first one is Western philosophy. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with your philosophy. Look at what it birthed. But I am saying mine's different. And so when I learn something, it goes to the center of my wheel of understanding in my brain. And everything I learn attaches itself to that by context. So I have this colonial understanding of things that started when I was three. And I've attached things to it. Over the more than half century I've been alive, I'm not going to tell you how old I am. You probably look it up, but anyway. <laughs> and so it doesn't matter what you start talking about. I can give you hours of my understanding of it because I'm willing out on it. I'm catching it as I go. And she says to me, then your knowledge doesn't get dismembered. And then she explained it this way. She said, one and one is two. It goes in and it gets broken up because it's compartmentalized. And then next year, two and two is four and it doesn't go beside one and one is two. It doesn't go to context. Accidentally it might in some genius fellow like maybe Einstein, right? But not very many of us uh, we compartmentalize. And remember, he didn't actually go to school. He was in a TB hospital. So he was educated quite differently from all of you. And I was educated differently from you. So when you break it down, you then you have to fish around for it. And it requires dendrites. In order for a dendrite to form, you have to hear it four times. That's why there's so much repetition in grade one, two, three, four, five. But if you're like me and not listening, <laughs> you're not getting it. <laughs> me. <laughs> didn't <laughs> decompartmentalize my mind. <laughs> but with you, everything's just going where it needs to go. And you're only picking up what you need to know. Which is what my ta used to say, you'll, you'll remember when you need to know. Because I'd say, how, do I, how am I going to remember all these stories? And she'd say, you remember when you need to know. So what's coming to me now is the memory of the, the flood stories, which is really our environmental knowledge. Why? Because we need to know that. <laughs> so boom, it's all coming out and I'm performing it all over the place with a, with a dancer. But it's my oral memory, which is completely different than the memory of all this written stuff and that. But I, all my knowledge is in one spot. I don't have to form the number of dendrites. So people say, oh, you're really smart. No, you have to work four times as hard as me <laughs> to pull up the memory. Because one piece goes over here in this part of your brain, another piece might end up in your feet, another in your butt. I mean, who knows where it goes, right? You have brain cells all through your body. They just found that out. I love white guys for that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the Indians are right. It's everywhere. <laughs> yeah, you talk about in this book, the knower's chair. Yeah. How That's that? what I'm sitting in now. <laughs> <laughs> you all looking at me. <laughs> talk, talk to me more about how you see the knower's chair. It started with uh, my friend Cecilia Haig Brown. Does anybody know who she is? Oh dear, she's the first person to write a book about residential school. 
and she credited the indigenous people in the book. So that's the other first thing she did. And her father was the person who risked his career and his family's existence to teach my great uncle law when it was illegal for us to learn it. Yeah, so close relationship, her and I were exactly the same age. We bumped into each other in Helsinki and we're laughing away and the guy comes up and says, oh, you've known each other a long time and we both say at the same time, we're family. <laughs> She's a white girl, I'm proud. I mean, <laughs> and he looks at us, okay, <laughs> off he goes. But she invited me to speak at an education conference and be the keynote. But the first thing that happened is up on the podium were these three speakers, all white, but all women. And in front of me is the teachers of Ontario, which are multiracial, right? Brown people, black people, Asian people, white people but they're only white on stage. And I thought, oh, I don't think you want me to give this keynote. <laughs> this is the wrong place for me to be, but I'm gonna do it. And I realized everybody's looking up at them. You're not looking up at me, because I like the rake here, but if I was in a longhouse, this would be reasonable. Higher rake, so that you, I had to look up. I would have to be looking up at you like this. And that's a humbling moment. But when you're looking down at everybody, not so humbly. So I didn't go up there. I asked him for a, a MOBA like this. And I stood on the floor. And I said that uh, 30 years ago, this has been three white guys. You remember that? And everybody starts clapping because most of the teachers are women, right? <laughs> but I said, but they're still all white. What is wrong with this picture? What is wrong with this picture? There's the knower's chair, first of all. Three of them filling it up, telling us how things are. And one of the women is talking about oratory and theater. We have 17 nations that I know about who have theater and oratory as their fundamental culture. And none of them are white except the Irish. And they didn't look very Irish. So what's wrong with that picture? We're not thinking that we could bring together the knowledges of the world and go forward with that. We're thinking to just keep going the way everything's been going. We just need nicer people in the knower's chair. Exactly. Exactly what I thought. I don't think so. So, one of the things we gotta do is get rid of the no worst chair, and that's what we do in our class. When I ask you what struck you, and you give your thinking, it has nothing to do with me anymore. And we did our first conference like that at U of T. It only took me 20 years to get there, but hey, 150 professors totally fell in love with the process. They could not stop talking about how much more they got when they used that process. Every single person ignites their own thinking and you have no knower's chair. You're all sitting in concentric circles. Different way of being, different way of learning, and way more understanding comes out of it. No knower's chair. <laughs> Get rid of the knower's chair. As you know, I'm working in a university system. There's lots of work happening across the sector. And I was really struck by the book and your very direct, <laughs> candid way of you know, exposing the university's complicity with stealing and incarcerating, that word incarcerating, our knowledges and our stories and privileging the written word over the oral and how it's so twisted that universities are now charging indigenous peoples to come and learn. I was, that really, sh that struck me. That, that was like a thunderbolt for me. Yeah, I think um, John uh, Mohawk, the great orator John Mohawk, 
was the first to person to bring to our attention that 90% of medicine is indigenous in North America. But when I was in China, they make it very plain that most of their medicine, what white people call ch uh, Chinese traditional herbal medicine, is not Chinese traditional herbal medicine at all. It comes from North America and primarily from Anishinaabes. So it should be called Anishinaabe medicine. And then they showed us the greenhouse where all the medicines are still housed. They still have that greenhouse for us if we want to come and learn our medicine back. Because they bought it off us way back in 1735, somewhere around there. It took them 20 years to buy all the, our medicines that we had here in North America. I mean, even pansies. I mean, who thought pansy? But but I remember thinking, oh my God, this is so weird. Because I do remember my time I'm making medicine. And then I, I realized that we don't have as much medicine as they have out here. And then I thought, well, that has to do with the age of the land here. Um, just north of here is the Canadian Shield, right? That's the oldest piece of land in the world. And the youngest, pretty much is all those mountains in British Columbia, all the way down to Baja, California. So we're newbies. The land is too, so it doesn't have as many plants. <laughs> you know, just, we don't have as much medicine. So most of our stuff comes from the sea. But if you live at the ocean's edge and you live off the, uh, the food in the ocean, you don't get as sick as other people. It's the land people that need medicine. So I started thinking about all that and um, thinking about how we're not credited for that, about how when they first came, they couldn't even wash, and which is why they called us filthy, by the way, because we took all our clothes off to wash. It was shocking. Once a day. <laughs> they couldn't believe. Because Queen Elizabeth I was the first person to shed all her clothes to wash, and she only did it once a year. And because she was the queen, she was allowed. But the rest jumped into public baths with their clothes on. You can imagine how sick they were. But even little children knew about medicine. Yeah. So that was the first thing. They acquired the medicine and then deprived us the right to practice. That was pretty smart. Cause so now, even our languages were purchasing back. They taped them all. When you think about it, I mean, I've never thought about it that way. Yeah. In the book, you have this this story, I, the um, the Johnny Whiteman story. I find that such a you know because it, it shows the this insanity yeah. over an intergener in an intergenerational way of how this appropriation of our knowledge and stories has occurred and how we're at this state now where it's 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 kind of. Yeah, and it's become critical for some nations. The Schwatnik nation has lost their language forever. They have to purchase it off this guy who's still alive. And that his estate will make them buy it. I mean, that's pretty, and they took, took him to court over it, and of course they lost. Because he changed the milieu in which the language exists. It exists on tape. And that makes it his, not ours. And so one of the guys that could speak the language went around trying to capture storytelling as opposed to the original stories. And that's when he came to see me. And I said, well, you're supposed to tell it back different but the same. But I don't know if you were, well, you didn't have to do that in, in that class. No, this is a new addition to the class. Anyway. Um, you take an original story like Atwood did with The Handmaid's Tale, straight out of the Bible, plucked a paragraph and turned it into a dystopian, a magnificent novel that is still like an energizing body feeding her Mediterranean habits. You know, she lives up there <laughs> on the Riviera. You know, I mean, it's just magnificent. So, <laughs> so I, I did that work with him and he, they started taking the original story lines and creating new stories from it. And that's how they got back um, their language with story. But they've had to make up new ones. 
from the old. Yeah. Would you read for for us? Sure. I, you know, I don't know if I brought my glasses. I think they're in the. Oh, they're in here. Otherwise, I'll have to make up stuff as I go along. That'd be okay too. <laughs> Not that I can't. You know. <laughs> I have so much crap. There it is. Reading glasses. One time I couldn't find them, and this lady loved me hers. And five years later, I did the same thing. thing same lady. Oh. <laughs> well, I'll just pull it out here. This is Hamilton. I mean, I just want to read this little bit on Hamilton because uh, it's so different. I'm in Hamilton, standing in the wind. The ride here was an adventure. A transport truck spilled its cargo on the highway. Well, that's not unusual. <laughs> we had to find a different route to our venue, so the tri trip took an extra hour. I worried about being late. We had to enter Hamilton from an alternate route, and the driver didn't know how to get to the go center from, the, from this direction. It was a bit comic, with the driver trying to figure out aloud where to turn next, and the passengers kindly offering advice, and everyone beginning to fear being late. <laughs> The driver let the passengers off wherever they wanted to get off. So the bus would lurch forward a little, stop, let someone off, lurch forward again. One or two of the passengers were actually let out in the middle of the block at some store or other. <laughs> in the end, I was let off at a, tan a random pair of crossroads named King and John. <laughs> Close to the go center, only I was not clear that I was near the go center. My driver found me via cell phone. Cell phone. Hurrah for math. <laughs> fiction could hothouse your reality. Whether it's science fiction or literary fiction or mathematical fiction, it can alter reality and drive change. Even that was comic. I want some more. <laughs> <laughs> Marginalization. Um, I don't know who invented the word, but I sort of attribute it all to Samir Amin, who said the foundation is on the periphery. Do you know that book, Unequal Exchange, or whatever it's called? He said that colonialism is the foundation of capitalism and that the colonies are on the periphery. And so I wrote this little poem that said, I would not like to live in a house that Samir Amin built, who thinks the foundation is on the periphery. And he thought that was the best criticism of his work ever. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I had to read it for sociology. I began, began coming to Ontario in the mid-80s, around the time of the early dub poets. I had been reading poetry in Vancouver some time, and a group of us formed a band comprised of my very young teenage daughters and a fellow college student, Russell Wallace, who was even then magic on his keyboards. My daughters sang back up in Ojibwe or Cree, and I read po poetry while Russell jammed on his keyboard and the girls played the big drum. My daughters were the first all women's big group, big drum group in the country. Generally women are not allowed to play the big drum. The men who taught them, the man who taught them to drum and sing paid no attention to those rules, which he figured were patriarchal and invasive. He was a Ojibwe. We were generally paid by people who wanted a poem about something. I would write a poem and my band would conjure the backup sound and music to go with it. It was called dub poetry as it began with a poem and the music was dubbed in afterward. My grandfather, by the way, was the first person in the world to do poetry and song together. And blacks picked it up and called it hip hop. At first, there was a great deal of resistance to having indigenous people on stage at traditional Euro gatherings, even when plenty of other people of color were represented. Our music was referred to as lexically running meaningless vocables. <laughs> so, actually, I gotta tell you this story. We did this song. And uh, I talked about lexically running the meaningless vocables, and the guy who turned that phrase was sitting in the front. And I said, but he doesn't know that, uh, you know, European music is made of the same thing. John Lennon was at this powwow, 
And these guys were singing, and then my girls go, ah, 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 and you know, <laughs> they start that push up. And he says to him, what are they saying? He says, you don't know. No. He said, he says, they're saying, love me, do. <laughs> <laughs> really? I said, yeah. Listen to it. So they listen to it. And it goes, love, love me, do. And so they do this push up, this creep push up to the tune of love me, do. <laughs> and of course, all the native people at the gathering are laughing, but none of the white people. <laughs> They're just so furious that I did this to John Lennon. I said, it's the first bit of appropriation. But you know. <laughs> not true. I mean, I just tongue and cheeking it all the way. And uh, and, he, and I said that they were lexically running, the, running meaning the spokables to us. Because that's not our language. <laughs> Love me too. <laughs> What does that mean? <laughs> Anyhow, <please> stop there. <laughs> I, I understand you're writing a new book with your daughters. Did you bring it with you as a poetry book? Is that right? Or yeah, it is a poetry book, and I wish I had brought the uh, manuscript. Doggone, there's the funniest poem about falling in love in there ever. But uh, maybe I could just tell you the story. We mm -hmm. we start off with colonization and end with falling in love. The book is called Hope Matters, and the title poem was written by Columpa, who's my second daughter, and she also writes the end poem. Um, But in the middle of all this is this, I'm 65, I think. There was this big storm in Toronto. It, we, it was flooded. We, I couldn't get on the, on the um, subway. So we sat in this bar, a hundred of us students and whatnot, waiting for the, the uh, dredgers to drain the subway <laughs> so we could ride home because they, the roads were flooded too, the buses couldn't run, trains were stuck, I mean, Toronto was a mess. <laughs> so we're getting all snapped up on beer there. I'm trying to go slow because you never know how long it's going to take. But we finally get on the subway and we go home. And I'm walking home and I'm thinking of this guy that I totally loved when I was a teenager. And then we meet up on the net. And he's still as handsome as ever. And he's still as wonderful as ever. And I think, oh my God, I'm falling in love again. Probably it was the storm. Oh my God, I'm, I'm getting hot. <laughs> oh my God, I'm, I'm wet inside and out. Oh my God, I'm a dirty old lady. <laughs> and so on. <laughs> I'm not sure how to, <laughs> to respond to this. <laughs> It's because I'm hot. <laughs> I love the way you talk about poetry. <laughs> I'm shifting here, guys. I'm shifting. Help me. <laughs> I, I do love the way that you talk about poetry, though, because I know in an essay, A Path to Freedom, I actually cited in my, my master's, which, please, don't ever read it, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I have to look it up. Yeah. <laughs> But you talk about the purpose yes. as something quite distinct. Can you summarize that for us? How you see that form of writing or genre of writing? First of all, I, I grew up with uh, the understanding that language lives under the skin. And so the trick of uh, remembering, I was training to be a rememberer, was to have words dance on the skin. So that's a poetic line. And you can say it in my language, you, you know, you can say that easily, but not so much in English. You can't find, I could never find a moment in the classroom to say that. You know, like people would say, oh, you're really smart, and I'd want to say, It's just that words dance on my skin. You don't know how to make that dance happen. And they're not teaching you here. And that's sad. It breaks my heart. So that's the first thing. And, and the second thing 
is that they live inside the body. And we believe they, learn, they speak the original language of your forebears. So I speak alchemy in my head and my body speaks it in my body. So we can have a conversation. And uh, you can't if you don't have your own language. You can't have a conversation with your body. And poetry is the language of the body. Extend the leg, feel the foot, lightly touch the earth, play with the sand. Those are all poetry images. Those are all the language of the body. It isn't, could you pass that cup? No, you won't find that in poetry. That's the language of enslavement. Because if you can reach the cup, you should bloody well reach it yourself. <laughs> and if you can't, somebody should notice that. You'd be a baby. And they should give it to you. So, the language of independence and spiritness, or spirituality, or whatever you want to call it, is poetry. The spirit wants to fly. The body wants to be careful. And so the body and the spirit have this conversation. Oh no, it must be the storm. <laughs> <laughs> she had to go back there. <laughs> I want to open it up to some questions. I know we're, we've got about 10 minutes left and a lot of you have come to join our conversation, so I'd like to open it up if there's anyone that has a comment, a question for Lee. Should I bring this over? It needs a verb. <laughs> we're about the verbs. You know, we were talking about metaphor one day, and we were trying to get a translation for what we were doing in the language school, and someone said, one step at a time. And I started to laugh. And this other guy who was the language speaker started to laugh. Now, we speak in two different languages. He's Okanagan, I'm Alkamilam. But he says, yeah, that's not a good metaphor. And this woman says, why? And he says, well, we're supposed to be cruising all the time. If you're going one step at a time, that means your old ties are pushing you, and they can only make you go one step at a time. So you're kind of this troglodyte that doesn't want to move. But in English, it's a positive, because stasis is where you begin. Positive begins with posit, which is to hold things still. So driftwood without a verb is a still dead wood log, which doesn't sit very well with me. I'd rather it be floating down the river to the sea, crashing through the canyon, knocking rocks off their shelves, banging on the other trees as they go and then sailing out to that mouth of that river 20 miles wide and trying to look for a place on the shore to rest. <laughs> did I say it was an improv poet? <laughs> when did you know that words dance on your skin? And if it was not when you were born, who helped you learn that? Oh, my grandfathers and grandmothers. It wasn't when I was born, that's for sure. But we do teach our children to speak early. Um, my, I got film of my granddaughters and my daughter speaking at three and a half months. Now they say in every book I've ever read that you're two before you learn to speak, but that's because nobody's actually teaching you. The first thing we learn is a song. Oh, he That makes the tongue move. You are born with language, but it's not organized in your head. 
And if you start to sing, it starts to, your brain starts to convolute. And you start to imagine things. And you start to attach meaning to the sound you're hearing. Now here's the interesting part of that, is that doesn't mean the person that you're teaching the words to is getting the same meaning that you have. And that's how humans become interesting and develop misunderstandings. <laughs> There is someone over here. Hi there. We talk about muscle memory. Do you believe that we have DNA memory and we have memories from our ancestors? No, I don't believe we have much DNA memory. I think we do have some, but I think it's around food. And what happens is it goes in, and the R I actually did an essay on this when I was only 20, when I first learned about DNA and RNA. It goes in, and the RNA looks at it and says, okay, I know what that is, it's wheat, we need so many vitamin B, so many minerals, so many enzymes, so many amino acids. We'll bust it up, and part of it will go out, the boot shoot if you want, and the other rest will go in the bloodstream. So that's how food works. Now the thing about that is it's structural. And if the body doesn't, the RNA doesn't recognize it, it kills itself trying to eliminate this thing. And that's how you get allergies, because snot's the big eliminator, right? Hachu, out it goes, it's gone, through the nose. <laughs> but uh, other ways is diarrhea, blah, 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 you know, if it's a foreign body. So we try very hard. Um, to eat as indigenous people according to our RNA and DNA. So that's its memory. The DNA is there for, for that. But the memory that's inside the ova is much more important. Now if the sperm was a quarter inch, the ova would be the size of this room. I like that ratio. <laughs> you gonna go where? <laughs> And it's a moving mass of brain material, not an egg. Chickens have eggs. We don't, we have ova. So when that uh, sperm comes along, it either grabs it or densifies and rejects it. They filmed it, you know. I don't know about the woman who volunteered for that, but there you go. She had a little camera inside there. So. That's how birth happens. And inside that brain is the capacity to create a human being and the memory of all time of that human being. It's very specific. And it's through the mother. So if you say, oh, in my, in my past life I was a cowgirl. No, you just remember one of your grandmas. You don't have a past life. Or maybe you do, I don't know. But you know, we have memory of all time inside our bodies. So. We can think things that our ancestors said, and you could say, where the hell did that come from? Oh well, and you just go on. Yeah, that's in the muscle. And another place, which is why I love white guys, because when we say words dance under the skin, there's an organ under the skin, did you know that? It's the size of the body. And this white guy a month ago found it. So we now have another organ. And all us scholars are going, yeah, we knew it. We knew it. <laughs> so it's also there. And it comes through the ova and the union of the ova with the sperm. It requires that union because the ova is otherwise a data bank of memory without an activity. The organ? There's no name for it oh, yet. Oh, there's no name for it. They have to it. figure out what oh. this organ actually does. Okay. I'm telling you what it does. We'll see if I'm right. You know, 20 years from now, they'll know. <laughs> Fascinating. We have time for one more question. Yes, go ahead, Teresa. Um, this might be a difficult question, and I know you said that when you were talking that you didn't know where we were going. But after reading this book, I, I spent the evening thinking about where are we going? Where should we go? So I wonder if you could take some time and just to imagine where should we be on Turtle Island in 50 years? Yeah, I haven't had that conversation with 167 nations in Takaranto yet. So I'm not gonna decide on that. 
That's why I don't know where we're going. I do know where I want to go, but that's a whole other question. When my children were small, I wanted them to be doctors and lawyers. That's not what I got. But I never told them that till they got something completely different. <laughs> Once they decided where they were going, I just helped them get there. So, no, I'm not going to give you that part of my imagination. I still encourage Canadians to start talking to each other across culture, across race, across gender, across ability, and, and, and make a, a plan of where they're going. And then when we get a lot of Canadians going somewhere, we can start meeting around the larger, larger picture. Uh, where I want to go might be where nobody else wants to go. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> so I guess that, that wraps us up. I just want to thank you, Lee. It's thank been you. it's been really a gift for me, and um, I hope to share space with you again soon. Yeah, that would be so fun. And thank you. <laughs>